sorry. Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my goal with all of this, uh, this just just as a kind of an introduction before we get into the introduction, um, this is basically a, a dry run, a test run of how something like this might go in the future. So this whole thing is just one big experiment, and I like to talk about Romans, and so that's how that became the center of discussion. Uh, so. We wanted to see kind of how a study group would function as an elective during the week. Uh, and all of our neighborhood groups meet Tuesday through Friday. So Monday night was the only night really available to us. Uh, that wasn't necessarily conflicting with any of those groups. Um, and then uh, also we wanted it to be an in-depth study because um, people who are serious about studying God's word are more than likely to come other than Sunday morning to do that. So, I appreciate all everybody's willingness to be here. Um, this is a 10-week elective, and again, that, that 10 weeks might be rather fluid. Uh, I, there's the, you have the workbook in front of you. I, at this point, I want you all to know there is no guarantee we are getting through this workbook in this 10 weeks. Okay? Um, Sometimes I, uh, I always stuff my lessons with a lot, of st a lot of things to talk about. And a lot of times I try to get through stuff uh, for time's sake and, and I lose people along the way. So I'm not going to ne necessarily do that this time around, especially since you know there's no worship service to get to or lunch to get to or something like that. So, uh, so with that, let's go ahead and begin. Are there any questions maybe? Starting out, or anything along those lines? No, but let's pray for it first. That was my next thing. Oh, jeez, you said we're just going to get started. <laughs> All right. Who would like to pray for us? Me. Oh, thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather. We ask now that we uh, draw upon the Holy Spirit that each one of us has within. Give us a calm spirit, a listening ear, and appropriate remarks. Thank you for Jonathan. Thank you for this time here. Bless those that are sad and dealing with really heavy stuff. Forgive us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So, um, just maybe by a show of hands real quick, who has ever done any sort of study of Romans before in their life? I'm sure. Yes. Okay. So a lot of us have, have talked about this text before. Uh, it is certainly the most talked about book of the Bible, period. I mean, there are more people that write on the book of Romans than the entire rest of the Bible combined. Like, that's just how much literature has been written over these 16 chapters. So, there is a lot of rabbit holes, a lot of different discussion points we could go down. Um, I mean, we could spend an entire 10 weeks on just the history of interpretation on the Book of Romans, which we'll do just a little bit tonight if we get to it. Uh, so, I'd be interested in hearing from you all exactly why uh, Romans is maybe one of your favorite books, or what about it uh, really piques your interest, um, and then maybe uh, what are you hoping to get from this study group elective? It's full of stuff, and when we did um, cantatas way, way back, before you were born, <laughs> there was a lot of uh, scripture that the narrator used that I like. Others, other scripture as well, but from Romans, and also um, I have trouble with recall now, and it will be really good to refresh and remember. Yeah. One of the first old things I remember is the Roman Road to Salvation. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have used it as it's a book that you can pinpoint. Yep. Yeah. 
Yep, certainly been used uh, to show the way to salvation for sure. Anybody have any favorite verses or passages? Yeah, this one to 38, 39. You want to repeat it for everybody? For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 8 1. 8 1. I like 12 1. That transforming, you know, that to me is a lifelong thing. That got to happen in our lives and you know us being a living sacrifice mm-hmm. I believe the will of Sai have arrived We are recording these, by the way, so don't say anything you don't want put on the website, because it will be on the website. So just just remember that. So uh, I'm recording it, so don't say anything that you wouldn't want to be put on the internet. When did you start that recording? I'm not gonna say. <laughs> don't worry, I can edit stuff out. So um, so yeah, if you do miss. Uh, a week and, and you feel or, com- or are compelled to be a, a faithful student and want to keep up and listen to my inspiring uh, leading of the study group, you know, all hour and a half or so of it, then those that, that will be available to you on the web. So And hopefully also pairing the, the presentation with it. Uh, so you've all been with me before, right, in some sort of uh, teaching exercise. So you all have hopefully have kind of gotten used to the way that I like to teach. Um, I, I do have slides with this. Um, I also am pretty heavy on the whiteboard. Generally, if I have slides, it reduces my whiteboard writing. So just letting you know. Yeah, he's tall, you know. So. <laughs> All right, so let's just really quick go over the, uh, the how this is really going to operate. All right, so we're on page six. I don't want to waste a lot of time kind of going over these things, especially since it's there for you to read. Uh, but as far as goals go, I've kind of talked to you about some of these already. All right, so this is an elective that's designed to educate uh, the participants in various disciplines and Pauline studies concerning his epistle to the Roman church. Uh, here's what we hope to achieve over the next several weeks weeks, that each person is challenged to go deeper in their understanding of Romans. Of course, that's probably uh, uh, the biggest thing that we're here for. Uh, That they are able to speak authoritatively on the subject of Romans and Paul's discourse throughout the letter, to provide a clear and concise interpretation um, that will shed light on an already confusing book of the Bible, to reveal current and historical interpretations. Uh, So we'll just kind of go over some things that have uh, reoccurred throughout history, uh, and to provide a historical setting where the book of Romans makes sense, and to have participants interact with one another throughout the series to learn from each other and their differing opinions, because, you know, you all don't want to listen to me for an hour and a half every night. So, um, as far as values go, uh, this is basically how we will operate as an elective. This is, these are the, the ground rules, uh, essentially, or, you know, being kind to one another, of course, is 
kind of the essence behind all of this. But each person will respect the opinions of others, even if you disagree with them, uh, that we will uphold all core beliefs uh, of New Lisbon Christian Church, of course, specifically pertaining to those beliefs about the Bible, that it is inerrant, infallible, and the inspired word of God. Uh, we will use the technology and resources available to us to help uh, interpret the book. The instructor, hey, that's me, will be presenting one interpretation of Romans as the best reading, but this does not speak on behalf of all leadership or as the only acceptable interpretation of the book. So the views expressed in this workbook are not necessarily that of the church at large. Um, the, that God will be working through us, with us, to reveal the author's intended meaning. Uh, and then obviously uh, this workbook is for your benefit uh, and hopefully it helps uh, more than hinders. Are you are the author? Um, more or less, yeah. So, uh, this was, um, I first put this together uh, at a previous church in Castleton, and um, I had all of four people attend that, so this is a big improvement. And, and the workbook is an addition. It was just the slides before, and even though I've gone back and redone these. So here's a basic rough outline of, of what we're going to cover over the next 10 weeks. So uh, basically the first eight chapters, and obviously this is kind of, you should understand that, that this is part one, okay? This whole series is, is like part one. Uh, part two will come in the spring when we finish the book because there are still eight more chapters. So uh, the, the first eight chapters are broken down as so. Uh, so the first but is obviously just introductory material that we'll get to next week. Uh, and then from there, Paul's going to talk about the wrath of God and how it's being revealed. And he's going to do it basically on how the wrath of God has been re uh, revealed to the Gentiles at large, to um, the uh, Gentiles who are trying to act Christian or Jewish, right? And then the Jews themselves. Uh, and then uh, chapter 3 through the end of chapter 4, which is probably my favorite part of the entire book, uh, especially the doctrinal core, okay? This is where it gets hot and heavy uh, in, in the book, uh, is the second half of chapter 3. It's talking about the saving faithfulness of God saving faithfulness of God and the work of Christ and the historical work done through uh, the fathers of the Jewish uh, nation you know Abraham Moses Adam those people uh, and then really chapters 5 through 8 are kind of one big section um, and uh, he kind of starts out with the end in mind and then kind of backs up and has to work his way to it and we'll get to all that in a couple weeks, but that's where we're going to talk about sanctification and glorification and all those great words that I love. I love to throw around. So, um, look, uh, let's look at pages eight through twelve. Okay. So one thing that is for sure about this book, okay, is that it is rich, very, very rich in the Old Testament. Okay, so I mean, Paul is is trying to explain how God has worked through the Jewish people to bring about salvation, and so in order to do that, he has to go back to the Old Testament to make his case. Okay, so all throughout the book uh, of Romans, he is quoting various sections of Scripture, uh, and so I've basically pulled them all out of the book for you, and you can see them right here for you. Uh, each time the Old Testament is quoted, uh, or maybe even just alluded to, then, uh, then you, can, uh, you can see what the reference is, and also where that, you know, what the general idea is. Um, so, some things that I want you to notice on page 11. It's that um, we're gonna need another chair. 
is that uh, Paul, so I, I like to look at things and break things down and kind of give some sort of you know, analysis of, of what he's doing here. And, and by doing this, we can see kind of what he favors the most, right? Uh, and if we look at what Paul is quoting, uh, then we can see that he's going to be favoring really three parts of the Testament. Uh, the first and foremost, at least as, as, as one scroll or as one book, would be that of Isaiah. Okay, he quotes Isaiah more than anything else, and then followed uh, closely by the Psalms. However, if you were to add up the Torah, because you have to remember, in a Jewish mindset, that is really one piece of work, not necessarily five books, uh, then that that also uh, adds up to a, a fair amount of quotes. I, I think it's, I have it 18 times, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is 17. Yeah. So, or total references. There are 18 total references. Uh, so the Torah is actually referenced the most um, in the book of Romans, which uh, we're going to talk about the law of Moses and and the Torah a lot. Any questions about about what you have before you? This is really kind of more just for your, maybe to use as a tool as we go through this. There's not a whole lot that I have prepared to say on this. So. Hello. Hey, Wayne. Anybody surprised at what uh, at, at his quotations and perhaps where he's quoting from. No, but I love that you've got them all written out here for us. Thank you. That's really nice. I yeah. like that. You're welcome. All right. Um, and then there are some thematically referenced sections of scripture um, where he's not necessarily saying any direct words from it, but the same ideas and concepts can be found in these other chapters uh, of the of the Bible as well. Um, Thematically. What? Theme. The theme. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, all I all I would say to you guys is so we're not actually getting to the Book of Romans tonight. So. Uh, I was worried we had to do it one through eight tonight. So. <laughs> 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 no. I read one through it this morning. I did too. I've been reading, reading it, but I thought I've been listening to it. Is. Um, it is it is pivotal, I think, that that maybe on our own time we go back and we read Deuteronomy twenty six through twenty eight. Obviously, we don't have time to necessarily yeah. sit here and do that as a group out loud. Um, but this idea. Hmm? Yeah, I just have them listed kind of in various parts throughout there. Um, it's it's going to be talking about um, Israel's faithfulness to the covenant, and if they are faithful to the covenant, then you know, then things will go well for them. But when they're not faithful to the covenant, things are not going to go well, and and a lot of that plays a huge backdrop into why Paul is having to write this letter in the first place. Uh, so Deuteronomy is very important, uh, especially the latter half of Deuteronomy. It's very important. Um, and then, of course, Isaiah. I mean, he quotes it all the time, so Isaiah is fairly important as well. And then, obviously, in Jeremiah, we get the idea of the new covenant. Okay, so any questions, comments? Yeah. It seems like, it seems odd that he would use so many Old Testament references to Gentiles. Figuring that, granted, a lot of the, a lot of the people who were Romans were Jews, mm-hmm. but also there were a lot of Gentiles in Rome that were part of the church, if I'm understanding that right. And he uses lots of, is, is that to get them to go to dive into the Old Testament and look at the Gentiles? Yeah, to get them yeah. to increase their education? Or... Um, 
Well, there are various opinions on that very matter. Um, and what I would tell you is that um, we should not necessarily accept the idea that these Gentiles are ignorant of the Torah or the Old Testament. Um, if there is some sort of Judaizing going on like we see in Galatians or in Acts 15, right? So the idea of do Gentile Christians have to act Jewish in order to be saved, okay? Um, if that is happening, then I think it's pretty safe to assume that, that, um, that they are going back to the Old Testament to learn for themselves exactly how to be Jewish. Um, uh, just for just for you right now, um, I'm going to be presenting this as Paul is writing to Gentiles who are trying to act Jewish, um, and and that they're doing that for for uh, for bad reasons. Um, sort of a, a take on on Acts 15 with the whole First Church Council and and all that, uh, as well as Galatians is very similar to the Book of Romans. So um, we definitely see that happening in, in the book of Galatians as well. Well, I guess I was just contrasting it to Hebrews, which is primarily aimed at Jews. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I understand that. Thank you. Um, throughout this uh, series, we're going to be talking a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot about salvation. Okay. Um, and this was something that I made up, I don't remember when, a while back. And... Uh, it's basically maybe an abbreviated version of the Roman road, okay? Um, but it kind of shows the salvation process. And if you're not used to that kind of terminology, that language, uh, this is definitely our time to certainly talk about that. So let me kind of zoom in here on this. When we talk about salvation, all right, uh, especially in the evangelical world, what we're talking about uh, is, well, when did you, you know, when did you get saved? Okay, so that's generally the question we ask. When did you get saved? Or, or you might say, I was saved back when. All right, and, and that language we see in the Bible. Okay, so that kind of language is in the New Testament uh, and that sort of thing. However, there is also language of salvation not coming yet, as in it hasn't been necessarily fulfilled all the way. Uh, and so what we're going to be seeing in the book of Romans, especially when we get into chapter 6 through 8, is this idea that, yes, we've, we've received some sort of promise, some sort of effect even uh, from Christ's death and resurrection that, that we can see and tangibly you know, deal with here in the now. However... Um, for Paul, salvation is always culminated in the resurrection of the body. Uh, and, and 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15 is basically his treatise to that fact. Um, so, Would you say that again? Yeah, so um, salvation, okay, we talk about salvation as we've been saved now. Okay, so when we talk about that, we're essentially talking about justification. Uh, that you've been declared innocent, all right, uh, and that the guilt or the punishment for our sin has been dealt with, right? So we are, you know, in the eyes of God, received a verdict of of not guilty, or or that, as perhaps Jack Cottrell would actually clarify, that that Jesus received that punishment of guilty for us, um, and so. Uh, in that essence, we have begun the salvation process. Okay, um, and then I would uh, probably argue the fact that we are now in the state called sanctification, or sanctification is essentially the idea of becoming more holy. All right, so that we are working with God through the Spirit, uh, and this is what Philippians is talking about. Uh, that that we are to be striving with the Spirit and helping us become better, essentially better people people of the of the kingdom um, the Sermon on the Mount which is what we're studying right now uh, in the sermon series is all about this uh, the book of James is all about this I mean uh, and and Philippians is certainly all about so sanctification is is all throughout the New Testament um, and, and Paul does use this language 
So he does say justified, sanctified, and glorified. And then finally, glorification is the verdict we get uh, on the day of judgment, that, uh, that, that final uh, innocent verdict, and, and so we are then raised from, raised from the dead. Uh, and so the, the idea of glorification is more or less resurrection from the dead. The part I didn't get, you didn't say again. Okay. <laughs> you say about resurrection. Okay, so for Paul, um, the culmination of salvation is always the resurrected body. First Corinthians Not 15. Jesus. You, 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 didn't mean, you mean my body? Yes, our body. Okay. I, I, now I know. Okay. <laughs> what was the 1 Corinthians? Did you say 1 Corinthians 15? 15. 1 Corinthians 15. So, Thank you. no problem. And there are ten uh, sermons uh, all about First Corinthians 15 on our website that we talked about back in the spring. If you want to go back and listen to those. Any questions about salvation? So, I what I like to say is that we're in the process of being saved. So you can say, I, I have been saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved, and all three of those statements are true at the same time. So it's kind of like you know the Trinity, right? So you might be banging your head up against the wall trying to understand it. Um, but that's, I mean, we see all of this language, especially in the book of Romans, and so when we put it all together, this is the process that we see. And, uh, and we do here believe that we are justified at the point of baptism. Uh, and that's when we receive uh, the promise or the mark of the Holy Spirit, which allows us to pursue righteousness through sanctification. We are freed from the power of sin. And then uh, either in death or at, or at the point when Christ returns, uh, we will be glorified. We will be raised and given our new bodies. So salvation is certainly one of the themes that runs through the book of, of Romans. Um, some people argue that it is the central theme uh, to the book of Romans. These would be like Martin Luther, those kinds of people. I'm not entirely certain that that's the case, but it certainly is very prominent. All right, so let's finally get to perhaps some some meat, you know, because we haven't talked about anything really important yet. <laughs> I say that tongue in cheek, right? So. All right, so what is a worldview? And I know I have it written there, uh, but maybe if we could get some discussion going amongst ourselves. What, what do you believe, or what do you know as a worldview? Here I might actually get out the markers. Is it just for you, ma'am? No, it won't. Are you talking about the world view now, just our present day world view? No, in general, world? what is a world view? Like, what do you mean? Like, once you're saved, you're always saved. Okay, yeah, I would say that's a flawed view, yeah. Um, For me, it's how I process the things that I see and hear around me as opposed to what I think God is in me or what God thinks of that, maybe. That didn't come out like I thought it at all. Well, but it was a good start. <laughs> well, you got the, you got the tenants, right? Donald Trump. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. No, I I think you're right, uh, David. That you, it's how you process the world around you, right? So we all have these like you know. So I'm wearing spectacles, right? I have glasses on. Okay, it helps me see all all your beautiful faces, right? Well, no, because I do not have that much hair. <laughs> I've never had that much hair in my life. So, um, all right. So, the and and Mark, you 
said it probably most concisely, a worldview is how you see the world. I mean, at its essence, at its core, that's what a worldview is, right? So if we are this person, right, so this is me, or maybe it's Tyler, because <laughs> he's got better hair for it, hey, right? I'm, I am not blind. Well, this, this would be your worldview, okay? Your lenses or your glasses are your worldview. It's how you see the world around you. And, and how you take it in is going to impact, you know, the way that you respond and react to things. So us Christians, we respond to natural disasters or, or even maybe terrorist attacks, uh, the death itself, differently than the rest of the world because we have the hope of salvation and, and, and that. So, you know, that greatly impacts the way we respond to the world around us. So our worldview is different than, say, an atheist uh, who sees things very differently. Um, and then even in the Christian world, you know, it gets down to different worldviews like Calvinism and Arminianism and, you know, Lutheranism. And of course, there's the restorationists who are all right, you know, and everybody else is wrong. No? Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, going into the Jewish worldview, you have to know I'm very sarcastic, so you just gotta roll with me. Okay? So, uh, so here is the, uh, the, the Jewish tenets of, a theological, of their, their, their theological worldview, right? The things that make up what they believe. Uh, and when you look at the Old Testament itself, or even what they were all writing in the day of, uh, of Jesus, uh, it really comes down to these three things, monotheism, election, and eschatology. Monotheism, election, and eschatology. Of course, monotheism is the belief in one God. Okay, We are all monotheists as well. Uh, but this really made... Judaism different than the world around them because especially in Canaan uh, and coming out of Egypt you know in a world where people worshipped uh, many gods and many idols so monotheism really made them distinct or unique from the world around them uh, monotheism is going to continue to be a point of contention with their neighbors you know so when when they're taken off in the exile for example and we see them in Babylon uh, you know, a, a, a terrible king named Nebuchadnezzar is going to make everybody bow down to an idol, right? And the monotheistic Jews in the in in Babylon are going to say no, and that gets them in trouble. In fact, it gets them thrown into a fiery furnace, right? So that's just one example of how monotheism has really made them a a, a genuinely unique people group, uh, which also makes us unique then too, right? Uh, the second is election. Now, us non calvinists don't like the word election, but it is definitely part of the Jewish uh, persona, the, Jer the Jewish worldview, right? So, you know, election is basically being chosen, right? To, to have so God went and, and, and chose the J Abram or Abraham, right? Uh, and, and Abraham did nothing to deserve that that election, that choice, right? So that that is election in itself. So this monotheistic religion that has Yahweh as God uh, chose one family, the family of Abraham, to bring his people into the world and his will through those people. This is making them unique because, well, it's, it, when, when it does actually become a, a badge of honor, all right? I mean, let's just think about it, right? So if, if uh, somebody who you thought highly of um, in the political realm, of course, I'm not going to name any because we'll get comments, uh, uh, then uh, selected you out of the entire country to come and live in the White House with them, okay? That would be a huge honor, right? So that's essentially what is happening here with Yahweh and and, and the people of yeah, the nation of Israel. 
Now, um, you know, perhaps choose the president that you like, you know, to have that, and it might seem better. Uh, but you have to remember, Abram knew absolutely nothing about Yahweh when he was chosen. Absolutely nothing. What about maybe the possibility of the sons, the, the timeline that he might have learned something in her, even though they worshipped the moon and all of that, that he might have learned something from Seth, from Noah. Mm-hmm. That time period's pretty close, so that he might have recognized, knew something about God, the creator, at least. Yeah, well, even most religions have some sort of uh, understanding of this was the creator God, right? Even if they do have many gods, there's generally one that was the creator, and, and uh, or even an unknown god, is like what we see Paul dealing with in Athens. Um, that I don't know. That's certainly a plausible reading. It's just something to throw out. Yeah, but there's nothing in the text to allow us to assume that he knows anything. Um, so, uh, just the idea that God chose Abram when he didn't have to. You know, he could have chosen Abram's brother, if he had a brother, I don't know. Or, or something along those lines. So, I guess, yeah, he would, because... Sarah. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so, yeah, those are, are various uh, things about election. And then, eschatology. Uh, eschatology is essentially, you know, the study of end times, right? Um, and, and eschatology makes us unique as well because we have a unique understanding of the end times. Um, for a Jew, it's a little different, uh, especially in the days of the Old Testament. Of course, now we would say that their understanding is wrong because uh, they missed the whole Jesus boat. Right? Um, but uh, when they came out of exile... You know, their covenant had been broken, and they were kind of wandering around um, in, in the various parts of the world, right? Um, yeah. Lost. So they, they, they choose, or they know that they have this one God who chose them, um, and, and that God had made a promise to the rest of the, uh, to the, the people uh, of Abraham that he was going to use them... Uh, to bring about a world ending like changes, right? So we go back to Genesis chapter 12 and 15 and 17 where God makes those promises of through you I will bless the rest of the world. Those who bless you I will, I will bless. Those who curse you I will curse. Uh, so those, those things, right? So they have that promise always in the back of their minds. When is God going to bring blessing to the rest of the world through us? Right. And so in the time of exile, they still have faith that this one God chose them to bring these good things to the rest of the world. And so now they're thinking, well, this is going to come about through a particular uh, king, Messiah, uh, who is going to bring restoration uh, to the lost people of Israel, bring the, the, the captives home, rebuild the temple, and basically rule the world from, from Zion. Um, so that their eschatology is that God will fix the world and he's going to do it through us so these three things are the most fundamental understanding of what they believed any questions about any of these Well, th- that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, well, we get the the first. Well, I mean, you could only go you could go all the way back to Genesis three, all right, and Genesis three fifteen, where uh, when God is uh, cursing the snake, he says, you know, I will stop. Uh, he, this woman's seed will, will will stomp your head and you will strike his heel, right? So that is the first promise. Uh, that God is going to do something to. Uh, but then 
I would also say in Deuteronomy, in those chapters that I told everybody to read, you're going to get that. Um, because it's going to talk about when Israel wants a king and then what God's going to do through that king. Uh, and then we see it again, um, uh, especially through the historical books, as the remnant God kept for himself, uh, people who are faithful to him. And that is all through the book of Chronicles and Kings and all that. So that's what you meant, that God initiated that thought of the Messiah. Yeah, and then, I mean, Daniel, right? So Daniel just kind of brings it home, right? So he's, you know, in Daniel chapters uh, 7, 9, and 2, right? So all those chapters are all going to be like, all right, there's a guy coming, and we're going to we're gonna want to know uh, when he's here because he's going to do something wonderful. Okay. Um, and then, you know, even with Malachi, you know, uh, the last book of the Old Testament, you know, that's the Christmas prophet, right, is what he's nicknamed. Uh, so he's giving prophecy of the coming Messiah. Um, so, I mean, it's all throughout the Old Testament. You know, uh, Isaiah, of course, you got Isaiah 53, um, and then the promise of the of the virgin, uh, which I think is Isaiah 7. So, yeah, the Messiah is rich, steeped very deeply in the Old Testament. So, any other questions? Are you all f- tracking with me? I haven't lost anybody yet. So just remember, monotheism, election, eschatology, and you're good. All right. So if those are the theological tenets or the core beliefs, the core doctrines. Right. We have core beliefs here. Uh, these, if these are the core beliefs, right? Then these are probably the three biggest symbols, all right, for the Jewish people. Uh, of course, the one on the far left is Torah. Right? That's the first five books um, uh, of the Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy. Um, second one, obviously, that's the temple, and then the third one is the land of Israel itself. Oh, I missed a slide about slavery and exile. I cry. What? I cry. Yeah, me too. Well, let's talk about these three things, then I'll go back and talk about the others. Um, so, throughout this series, uh, Paul's going to reference the law, okay? Uh, and just so you know, um, sometimes in your Bible there'll be a, a lowercase a or L. Sorry, I don't write in lowercase very often, so that's kind of odd for me. Um, and then sometimes it'll say law with a capital L. All right, and uh, and so what what's happening here is in in the Greek language, okay. They have words for the. In fact, there are 24 ways to say the word the. Um, so if there is no capital L, then uh, it's there's no um, there's no the before it in Greek. Which what's that called again? What? The the form of. Definite article, yes. Yes, for versus an indefinite article, which is A. All right, so uh, if there's no article, then generally scholars assume that it should be indefinite and it'd be A law, right? Uh, if there is a capital L, then that means that in the Greek language that there is a definite article before it, so it's the law, right? Uh, do not be misguided by their poor translation of the text. Okay. I will point that out because in Greek, it does not matter if there is any article in front of it. Okay. All we have to do is talk about John 1.1 1, 1, uh, to get around that concept. Because in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay. In Greek, there's no the before God. And so... Whole groups like Jehovah Witnesses have lost their way because they say, well, that's 
a god, not the god. And I'm like, you don't know how to read Greek, right? So, they, oh, that's true too. So, uh, some of the nicest people in the world, right? But, you know, lost, completely lost. Uh, so, um, yeah. There's 24 ways to say the in Greek, but it doesn't matter. Why are there 24 ways to say that? It all has to do with the case endings. Did you take Spanish? Yeah. All right, so you know there, there's different ways to end words, uh, masculine, feminine, plural, singular, and then uh, neuter, right? So the, you, you take those different words and have different case endings, and the words that parallel with that one also have to match those case endings. So the the looks different depending on the case ending of the word. So there's a masculine form of the, uh, there's a feminine form of the, and then in four different cases, genitive, um, indicative, a lot of them. Yeah. Accusative. All right. So just ask your Spanish teacher and she can, or he can explain. Okay. Yeah, I hate it. So, um, so yeah, not not that's none of that is important really. It's just to say to the fact that whether it's a lowercase L or a capital L, he is always, always, always referring to the Torah. Either way, either way, he's always referring to the Torah. No. I would say it applies to anything that uh, Paul wrote, yeah. Which we don't really see this happening outside of Paul's writings anyways. Um, so in, you know, in Greek, this is law, all right? Um, and uh, there's the the. It's accent mark, all right? So uh, the law. Uh, is how it's translated into English. However, if we go back to um, the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint, they use namas always, uh, which is how it's pronounced. That would be its transliteration, right? They always use namas to um, to describe the Torah. <coughs> You all were really hoping to get a Greek lesson today, weren't you? I thought you said "vamos." Yeah, that's an N in Greek, and that's an M. Obviously, that's an S. Yeah. So, uh, the Torah or the Law. Um, in fact, you go to my Bible. Uh, not this one. I've highlighted all the times it has law in it. Um, and some of the other ones I've actually gone through and, and written in Torah as opposed to law. Can we assume that through the New Testament, by other writers, that that can carry through? Or not? Or is it unique to Romans? Well, Rusty kind of asked. Uh, was asking about that too. Um, this issue really doesn't happen outside of Paul's writing. Um, so um, in Galatians, uh, especially as well, we see this. Yeah. And Jesus, when he refers to. Well, I'm trying to think of a time. When he actually says the law. Yeah, because he he, some, he generally references Moses. I mean. Um, I can't think of one right Yeah, now. I can't think of one either. So maybe we could I'll I'll if I remember I'll look that up. The the problem with the the, the articles, right, mm -hmm. is because in English we, we like our articles. Uh, but in Greek they, they they're they're fluid. <laughs> they don't necessarily have to be there. In fact they can be two words over uh, from from the the word that it is describing. So, and the words can share a definite article. Like Greek sentence structures, right? Uh, 
Uh, so, Torah, crucially important. Of course, this is the covenant, right? So this describes the covenant relationship between God uh, and his people. Um, and so the covenant is, is what matters uh, to them. If they're keeping the covenant, things are going well. If, if they're not keeping the covenant, things are going badly. So next, let's talk about the temple. Um, the temple is, uh, so all these three things are very important, right? I'm going to keep saying that. So the temple is like the physical center of the Jewish religion. In fact, they would say it is the physical center of the world. All right. So if, if you've done uh, my kingdom uh, of God study, uh, you should remember that when we talked about the temple, that it's essentially how it's a it's a way of measuring how close you can get to God in the Holy of Holies, right? Where the Ark of the Covenant is. And the Ark of the Covenant is the thing with the cherubim, that the, yeah, the mercy seat, yeah. So, but I always like to reference, you know, Indiana Jones. Right. So anyway. So that's where this thing is, this box, okay? And the mercy seat is God's throne room, uh, or God's throne on earth. And so the whole object is to get as close to that spot as possible, you know? And so the, uh, um, the priests could get in here. You know, the Levites were a little further out, which priests come from the Levites. And then you got your Israel men. Sorry, women, you were left further out. And the Gentiles. Yeah, and then the Gentiles. Saul just kind of snuck in. Yeah. Yeah. You mean Saul is in Paul? No. The little guy that heard God speak to him. That's not the right name, is it? Oh, no, you're talking. Um, see? Yeah, Samuel. Samuel. That's who he's talking about. Oh. Well, so did all the prophets. Well, yeah, God's prophets are like his back door. Yeah. You know, they're his special chosen people. Um, so, you know, and the law is basically determining how close you can get to this thing. Right? So, the temple is the physical center of the world for them. Um, in fact, it is not only the center of the world, it is their chief economy as well. It is the center of social life. If I misspell something, just know that I do that on a regular basis. Okay. And then point it out to me and I'll feel embarrassed if I fix it. Um, and uh, uh, along with the economy, uh, there's a lot of food that is dispersed through the temple. Um, so uh, it is also, let's not forget, uh, teaching. This is where Jesus spent a lot of time teaching. This is where the church, early church in the book of Acts is going to meet to conduct the worship services. So the temple fulfills many needs in the life of Israel. Many needs. Uh, in fact, what we see here is the second temple, um, but in actual, actuality it's the third temple, but whatever. So the first temple would be the one that Solomon built. The second temple would be the one that was built and it came back from exile. And this is Herod's temple. Um, and this is the one that Jesus would have seen when he went to Israel. It is, in fact, the largest temple mount in antiquity. There's no temple 
Like the building itself, yes, there are others that are bigger. But the temple mound, there is no other temple mound in history as big as this one. Now, when you look at it, it's kind of on top of a mountain, kind of overlooking a ravine, right? And so the Romans are going to come to this thing and say, hey, that thing looks like a fortress. And in fact, it becomes used as a fortress basically in all the revolts. It always comes down to Rome has to go in and finish people off in the temple. That's where they bunk down. So uh, the temple is extremely important, even to the life of the people uh, who are trying to fight for freedom, even if they were misguided. So I wish it was still around, but... It is not. It was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. They came in and knocked it down brick by brick. The mound is still there, or part of the mound is still there, uh, and that's where the, t uh, the Dome of the Rock sits. That's a model. Ah, okay. That makes sense. Right. So, apparently, it's a very good model. Yeah, if you go to Jerusalem, they have one that's like, you know, it would, yeah, they have the whole original city kind of scaled. It, it would take up like this room and that room. I mean, it's it's pretty big. I've never seen pictures. Of, I've never actually been to Jerusalem. Uh, and then finally, the land is also important because the land is is it, uh, the sign of the covenant, right? So when when uh, God brings his people into the promised land, right, that was their gift for being followers of Yahweh. Uh, and they had to go in and take it from the Canaanites, uh, city-state, city-state. Uh, and so this land is their land, okay? This land is... Uh, <laughs> Um, and uh, it's very valuable, um, not only because it was a blessing from Yahweh, but it, as the temple is the center of the world, in history, in, in antiquity, in the time of Rome and Greece and all that, it really is the center of the world. So if you wanted to get anywhere outside of your own little hub or finger, right, uh, of the different continents, you had to go through Israel, or, or else you were taking a boat. Uh, and so there was a lot of shipping lanes that would come through here. The King's Highway went ran through here. Uh, and uh, it's because of that that Herod makes all of his money, Herod the Great. And he's going to tax out the wazoo, the people who are traveling back and forth. Um, and so that's how he gets all of his money to do all these massive building projects. So like Herod, uh, because he left a lot of history. Uh, he he built a lot of stuff. Of course, we don't like Herod, you know, because he was a jerk. <laughs> he was evil. Yeah, yeah. He strangled two of his own sons. So, because he uh, they he perceived them as threats to his reign. Okay. Killed all the babies in Bethlehem. Yeah, yeah, he did that. So lots of bad things this man did. Um, he uh, he was a coward as well. He didn't go fight with Mark Antony when when he called for him. Uh, probably one of the reasons why Mark Antony lost the war against Octavian and Cleopatra, that whole thing. So so yeah, Herod was pretty influential in history. Um, ah. Here's my slide. I knew it was there. Yeah, back up a page. And we won't spend a lot of time on this. Other than the fact that the two most important events, probably other than the actual giving of the covenant and establishing a relationship with Yahweh, is the slavery in Egypt. All right, because that is the is a point in in the in the books that, of the Old Testament where they say, you know. Uh, we're, the, we're, you know, like we're the people of God, the, the, the God that led us out of slavery in Egypt, right? So that's a pretty popular phrase, right? And then the exile is also important because it's going to shape 
their understanding of who they are leading in, into the time of Jesus. Um, and, and exile is something that... Um, so we have the dates, right? 586 to 522 uh, B.C. Um, and, and while those, that's their time away from the land... We need to understand the fact that the exile really kind of lingered on after that, right? So if we think about what exile means, right? So yeah, they were sent off. They were, they were cast out of their own land for basically being wretched people and, and not following God. Uh, so when they come back, though, they have to you know, basically rebuild everything. Um, However, they're always under the reign of a foreign oppressor. So they are never left to really establish the throne of David. All right? and, and one of the things that the Old Testament talks about, especially in Daniel, uh, is that the exile will end when David's throne is restored. Obviously, that does not happen. Um, so... There's several scholars around who say that, yeah, they returned to the land, uh, and in many ways the exile ended, but in many ways they really still saw themselves in exile. Uh, they were captives in their own home. Uh, and so, you know, that, that whole idea, that whole mentality leads to so many problems in the first century. So many problems. You got the Hasmoneans. Uh, who rise up in the first century BC and they, they or the second century BC and they, they try to take over the land and they're successful, right? That would be the Maccabean revolt, right? Uh, you've got uh, several revolts that happen when Jesus is alive. In fact, he references one of them um, in, in the Gospels, uh, and then you've got the 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 revolt in. In 70, when Rome finally comes and destroys them, so the first century world uh, for the Jews is actually very, very tumultuous. Uh, you got sects of people leaving uh, and, and finding and establishing their own little communities, like the Qumran community, right? The Dead Sea Scrolls, yeah, the Essenes, the Qumran people are, are probably Essenes, right? And so they were. Uh, lots of people trying to stir up lots of problems. Of course, Jesus helped, took one of these people along with him. Uh, the zealot, right? So the zealots were people who were militant, right? These were terrorists uh, going around and causing all sorts of problems. And so uh, it's probably likely that a lot of people in the first century looking at Jesus and all the people following him, like the 15,000 that he probably fed, you know, at the feeding of the 5,000. It's like, is this the time when he's raising up an army to go and take Jerusalem? So, let's take a breather, right? This has been kind of a lot of heavy stuff. So, any, uh, any uh, questions or comments anybody wants to make? Anything we've talked about? Yeah, so Herod the Great was actually the only one that was ever allowed to have the title of king. And that's because he was buddy buddies with the with yeah, with the Caesar. And um, and his sons always wanted that title but they were never given it. Uh, and so Because Herod is just a title, right? Well it, it isn't I mean, because there's they were all Herods and his sons were one thing. It was a family name. Herod was his name. Right? Is that what you're asking yeah, about? Yeah. yeah. Herod. No, it's not a title. It's a it's a family name. Okay. <coughs> but yeah, there were several Herods and Herodians for the for the women folk, right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. They Jesus. Too great either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Jesus has to deal with three different Herods. Uh, so, and then and when we get into Acts, there's a whole nother Herod. So that it gets all confusing. But yeah, that's their actual name. 
Well, when you think about being separated as being in exile, they still are. Mm -hmm. The nation, the nation of Israel now is very humanistic and yeah. I mean, it's not a godly nation like the original Jews. Were yeah. What what what's left today barely resembles what we see of biblical Judaism. Um, you know, obviously they don't have the temple, so you can't really be a good Jew if you don't have the temple. So. Jonathan, I just received word that Phyllis Woodward has passed away. That'll mean something to some people in here. Um, they farmed and lived around here. I taught with Sandy. And you want to say a prayer for the family? Yes. All right, let's pray. Lord, we just ask that you uh, are, are with this family. Uh, during their time of trouble uh, and difficulty. Uh, and and uh, Lord, I'm sure many people in this room uh, know them better than I do and can speak to their uh, character and, and faith. And Lord, I just pray that you surround them with love and your presence uh, during this time. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. No problem. Um, so, uh, any questions? So let me ask you this. Uh, obviously, we're all Americans, right? Now, um, without perhaps delving into too much political banter uh, this evening, um, imagine, if you will, um, Canada, all right? Because how ludicrous is this, right? But Canada comes and just uh, you know destroys us as a nation, all right? Demoralizes us knocks down our White House and our, and our Capitol building and the Judicial building and all that, right? And then carries us all off into exile, forces us from our homes. I mean, how would that make you feel? We need to take our handguns. <laughs> Probably why Canada will never be able to actually have that. But, you know, <laughs> hypothetically speaking. Yeah. Will they be sharing the <laughs> the deciding factor then? I'll go with this baby. You won't have a choice. And that's what we can't understand. We have so many choices, choices in this country and so many rights and so many I can twos that we don't even understand no choice. You will do as I say, when I say, or I will kill you. And we don't know what that means. I don't I don't know what that means. That's why submission is such a hard thing for us. You just gotta to speak God, up way. to whatever. Submission. Yeah. We don't know. Yeah, Wayne. You bring up a good point too, so it depends on the generation in which you ask this question. Obviously, mm -hmm. the Jews, and I see where you're going from this, the Jews, would, uh, from the generation in which they were taken and put into exile, would be completely different from the generations removed. I would put every single fight that I could. In fact, I'd probably die fighting the Canadians at that point. Mm -hmm. The remainder that succumbed to the, to the, uh, the capture from, uh, from Canada. There would be some turmoil there. There would be a rebellion that would try to come up, and but eventually, if that got squashed completely, there would be all hope given up, and they would succumb to whatever that uh, captive or that uh, captive's ways are. Their governing, their religion, their thought process, and everything that we held true in the past would probably, more than likely, be completely swept under the rug and lost. Now we'd have a little remnant of us that wouldn't go. <laughs> if you're good at carrying on tradition and yeah. the stories which they did, their law and everything, and that's the only yeah. thing that kept it in. They mm -hmm. didn't have that history of spoken story, which we don't in the U.S. It's, that's now been lost. 
um, we would we would never see the U.S. again. Yeah, I mean, just the whole idea of being ripped from your your homeland and and forced to live in a very hostile environment, you know, um, I I just can't imagine what kind of fears that would bring. Yeah, but even in that, you know, God still works uh, for His people. I mean, look at Daniel, look at Esther, and you can see it in the Middle East. If you ever had a chance or an opportunity to go there and just see the cowardice of the people that live in that land, it would just it, it makes me want to vomit. The they, they, there's no other than the ones that hold the rule through terrorism over these people. There's no it's just lukewarm. It's uh, The, the mindset, imagine the mindset of your kids staying in, the, in, a, in, a, in a neighboring town in which there's constantly fighting and bombing and, and, and terrorism. Wouldn't you want to uproot your family and go somewhere else? But they don't. They just, it's part of their life. They've given into it. They're just cowards. They have no fight for themselves. They've given completely in. Hmm. Thank God goes back a little bit to your world, world view as well. You know, like like what I said, us for our generation now that our world view would be completely different. Four generations from now, children that were born at the as slave their world view would be completely different. We would look at it as courage. They would they wouldn't see it as cowardice, they would see it as this is all I know. This is what yeah. I was raised in. This is the way the world is. That's their their worldview becomes I'm a slave and so is all my family. That's just that's yeah. not right or wrong. That's just how it is. You know what I mean? It's just yeah. It's just, yeah. It's just, yeah. It's just, yeah. And, and the whole Moses is Jewish mother who evidently carried down the world tradition of Jewish history. Mm-hmm. So yeah. It's, it's just interesting to see how you worldview changes. I mean, even in America, if you're if you're raised, you know, in a, in a different family environment, in an inner city with maybe only one parent, and there's violence, and you know, your worldview is completely different. Or just a different how she is. The difference between a family that has a tradition of military service, right, where for generations, so let's say the guy to be good and chauvinistic, has gone off to war as opposed to a family that's never had a soldier in it, they look at the world in a completely different way. The, the idea of bravery and cowardice, I don't know if that has the same meaning to, say, a non-military family versus a military family. Right. And, and, yeah, that's that's a good thing that after several generations... And even if all those people are Christians, their worldview is still different. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. You know, just, just yeah, I, mean, I, I can even tell you, like, I'm from the city, right? So, I, I grew up in Coleraine Township. It's a township of 55,000 people. Um, and just in my year and three quarters here, uh, you know, you know I, we, we see things differently. And, and that's just the nature of, of growing up in different areas. There's a certain strength that came through being in the tough environment, uh, uh, even a even a violent or dangerous environment. I, would, I wish I had that in my Christian life. I feel um, complacent, um, whereas I look at some other Americans that hadn't been in the military that in the same light. I, I feel that way as a Christian. I feel complacent. I feel weak. I feel vulnerable. I don't feel as though I had been training the way that I had in, in other areas. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, I it, it could go so far as to have that kind of impact on Christians. Eight years apart down the road that we are now. God's sovereign. I'm not, uh, that's what I'm relying on. Politics is not. Christians from uh, like China think they need to come here to be missionaries. Yeah. Because they really know. England's real bad too. I mean, I would have partied with that at one point in my life. 
I would not argue with that mm-hmm. statement now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Dear Jesus, come yeah. get us. Chinese missionary, come save us. Whatever it takes. The um, uh, I think it was about ten years ago, give or take a decade. Um, so yeah, I'm real, real precise on this date. Um, the center of Christianity moved from the northern hemisphere to the southern. So there are now more Christians south of the hemisphere than there are above it. Uh, and that a lot has to do with um, you know missions in Africa and South America is just booming. Which so get, I mean God is advancing His kingdom. Um, so let's uh, perhaps try to wrap this up. All right, and we've kind of hit on a lot of this already. <clears throat> Just that, it, it, just a few comments about these things. You know, the beliefs of Judaism. We, we we already went over that, right? It's the monotheism, election, eschatology. I was just seeing who. Okay. Monotheism, election, eschatology. All right. One more time. No, I'm just kidding. All right. So those those beliefs are central, right, to their understanding of the world around them. Uh, just like our core beliefs are central to our understanding of the world, you know, around us. And those beliefs are what's going to cause all the different fractions in Judaism. It's going to cause the Zealots. It's going to cause the Essenes. It's going to cause the Pharisees. You know, and so. Those beliefs and how they're interpreted vary a little bit, but you know, we they they go to fight for what they believe in, and they do it differently. Um, you know, some literally go to war uh, to fight for what they believe in, and others don't. But the the beliefs of Judaism are a pretty important backdrop to this this book uh, in Romans. The expectations of Judaism, we obviously, uh, we've talked about this already. <clears throat> because of their beliefs, they are expecting the world to be made right through them. They are expecting this to be done through uh, the succession line of David and his throne being restored. Um, and, uh, and they're expecting Israel to return to the glory days of David. Because nothing for Israel was ever as good as than when David was on his throne. So we have these people in some rather close relationship with with Yahweh, this this God who has chosen them and to act through them to bring about the salvation for the whole world, right? And uh, and. Perhaps if we were to bring this all down to one idea, uh, the Jews were a covenant people trying to demonstrate faithfulness to Yahweh, showing themselves worthy of God's promises and grace. This is perhaps the key to unlocking uh, the confusing book that is Romans. When we understand this, this concept here, then I believe reading through Romans could make a lot more sense. Uh, granted, a lot of it does make sense, but there are passages where it's very confusing, and I'm not even real. <coughs> I'm not sure about some of it. Um, but this is the motivation uh, that Paul is wanting to address in his writing. Um, the next lesson was on the law. We've already talked about that, so uh, we can move on. <clears throat> but 
those were that was page 19 through 20, and um, those are basically just different uh, places where I pulled out where the, the idea of law being Torah um, uh, and how that fits. All right, so. All we have left then is Paul through the ages, which is just that last page, 21, before we get to the introduction of Romans. Um, <clears throat> so, people have been trying to understand this book ever since it was written, all right? Uh, and and it's, it's so complex, and it really is difficult to kind of hold his entire argument in your head at once because there's so many nuances and different uh, understandings and, and, and different aspects he's trying to you know stress at different points throughout the book so it can be rather burdensome to try and think of of his entire argument all in once right so uh, nevertheless uh, people have tried Okay, and so we're going to highlight just a few of these people. Uh, first one is Origen. Uh, he's a uh, one of our church fathers. Okay, so he did a lot of writings uh, in the second century and third century uh, A.D. He's part of the Eastern Church from Alexandria. He was anathematized. That means he was excommunicated uh, from the church because he had some cuckoo beliefs, but uh, he was... Uh, like cuckoo, or just the church at the time didn't like him? Like he had... Um, I'm trying to think of them now. His understanding of God was, uh, was not necessarily up to par. Um, he was also kind of um, influenced by some Greek philosophy and that sort of thing. So uh, there was good reason to uh, to kick him out of the church. Um, I guess I don't know if you're in that kind of thing. So, uh, but the essence of the way he is interpreting Paul is that he's trying that he sees Paul trying to join together the Jews and the Gentiles. So if for him, everything comes down to this this relationship of Jews and Gentiles and how do they relate to one another Gentiles right and uh, so his point is that God has brought them together through Jesus all right Pretty basic understanding all right but it, it develops from there so the next guy we want to talk about uh, is Augustine of Hippo Hippo is a town Okay, not an animal uh, in this case. Um, and he is from the Western Church, you know, because at this time there was the Western Church and the Eastern Church. They didn't, work, they didn't necessarily play nice with one. Um, and uh, you can see when he lives. But he sees Paul kind of explaining salvation of individuals from original sin. So that doctrine of original sin that, uh, you know, we all love. Uh, to hate, at least if you're me. Um, he's the one that basically came up with it. And so he sees Paul trying to address this sin problem. And this is how, this is how Paul does that. Um, so we've all heard of Augustine, right, at some point. Uh, he he basically becomes famous for arguing with a guy named Pelagius, who was uh, uh, believed you had to earn your own salvation, that kind of thing. So uh, so he's going to push the justification by faith concept and, and anyways. Uh, next is Aquinas. Um, he's I I, I kind of picked him out really out of a grouping of, of scholars from around the turn of the millennium. Now, I, I granted, he's living in 1225, which is not so close to the turn of the millennium I get. Okay, But he's kind of uh, in a larger group of scholars who were living earlier than him as well. So he's, 
these people are going to try and, and reconcile Origen's concept of this is the main idea as to why uh, Paul is, is writing is to join the Jews and the Gentiles together, uh, but also with this understanding that, yeah, salvation is a pretty prominent role and justification is all throughout it, and so maybe those two roles are kind of together. Um, of course, I picked him because he's probably the most famous of the people of this period. Um, he uh, is a saint, uh, so, you know, uh, that's cool. Uh, and then he is known for his natural theology, right? Uh, natural theology uh, is basically um, what we might call apologetics, uh, trying to prove God exists through logic and reason and nature and that sort of thing. So uh, he was pretty good at that. Uh, the next one is probably the most famous person from the church in history, um, you know, uh, so he lived around 1500 A.D., um, and this guy certainly left his mark on the church. We are all sitting in this room because of this man, uh, and so we certainly need to do uh, give him his respect, uh, but at the same time, we need to kind of hold him at arm's length, okay? So uh, he kind of, first of all, uh, he... he initially basically started the Reformation uh, by hammering his 95 theses onto the church uh, in the center of town um, and uh, and that led took him down a path where he eventually left the Catholic Church uh, and obviously Lutherans are kind of people who claim him as their as their uh, father I suppose uh, I'm not sure he would be happy with that because um, he never really wanted to split the church, but nevertheless, that's what happened. Uh, so he kind of he he likes Augustine a lot, all right, and he's going to further Augustine's work that yeah, Romans is all about how we get salvation, right, and and all the other stuff is really kind of just hearsay or, or stuff that's not necessarily important. And so he sees Paul basically doing battle with Jewish legalism. Uh, people who were trying to follow the law in order to earn salvation uh, and that is um, basically his idea and, and he coins the phrase justification by faith alone okay so uh, we basically need to throw this language out of our out of our our box of language okay because justification by faith alone is nowhere in the Bible so, in fact, the only time uh, being uh, justified by something is by your works, and that's in the book of James. So apparently, he didn't like James. In fact, we know he didn't like James because he put that book in the appendix of his of his uh, German interpretation. So, uh, Luther is extremely important. Okay, because he starts people down this road, uh, and he is basically the, the father of uh, Reformed theology. Uh, so Calvin comes really from Martin Luther, Cal uh, and Calvinism and all of that. So uh, him and Ul Ulrich Zwingli are all pretty prominent reformers. Now, uh, the last guy on here that I'm going to point out to you is my favorite, N.T. Wright. All right. Yeah, I am a groupie, I suppose. All right. NT stands for Nathaniel Thomas, just in case you were wondering. He goes by Tom. His birthday is 1948, the month or day, because I'm not that creepy. Um, he's part of the Church of England. All the best writers are him and C.S. Lewis. Uh, he currently resides in Scotland. He works at St. Andrews, which is the oldest uh, school or university in Scotland. It was started in. 14 something uh, AD. So that's pretty cool. He works in a castle. You know, I wish I could work in a castle. Of course, I love working here. Don't get me wrong. Uh, it was pretty toasty in my office today. So, uh, so he's going to kind of return to Origen's I idea that Paul's explaining the union of the Jew and Gentile via the faithfulness of Jesus' work on the cross and Jesus being the representative of Israel. So uh, he, let's see, do I have it in here? 
yeah. Uh, if you see it, it starts out with new perspective or NPP, a new perspective on Paul. Let's see, it's eight o'clock. Um, I was going to go on about the new perspective, but which he is a part of. Uh, so, just briefly, I suppose, uh, he is part of a, a thread of scholars, uh, a group uh, of scholars that are really kind of combating against Martin Luther's understanding uh, of, of Paul and really Judaism altogether. And... Uh, so that's why I like him so much, one of the reasons. Um, but he's also a really good writer. So they basically are saying that Paul is uh, trying to show that the Jews and Gentiles really have no distinction anymore because Christ did away with all the barriers of Judaism. Uh, and that was his whole point uh, of you know, dying and raising on the cross and all of that was, was to bring salvation to the world. Right? And as he says, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. So their understanding is that, I guess at the center of it all, is that Judaism really wasn't a legalistic religion um, and that we come to know as Pharisaic Judaism or the Pharisees. Okay? Uh, if you go back and you look really at the whole thing and you look at the monotheism and you look at the election and you look at the eschatology it, it really is a religion of grace uh, in that God chose them when he, he didn't have to uh, and they saw themselves the sign of the covenant was was grace in itself it was a way to have a relationship with him when they didn't deserve to have a relationship with him you know, so if you think about all those things from this idea of grace then then Judaism is not so legalistic as perhaps our evangelical world would like it to be I think it gets twisted by some people during Jesus' time, of course. Um, especially, we, we do see some form of legalism with the Pharisees. That Granted, there's that. Um, but their ideas of you know, needing to keep circumcision and the Sabbath and the dietary laws and all of that is, is because their understanding is this, we're in this relationship with God, and this is what we ought to do in order to keep up that relationship, in order to persist in that favor of God. It's not what we probably grew up with as I need to do this to earn God's favor. It's I've received God's favor, so let me do this for him. Uh, and that when you make that transition in your head and in, in how you look at Judaism, it, it 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 becomes very different. And especially how you read the book of Romans. And Deuteronomy, I mean, yeah, I mean, the whole Old Testament. So so with that, I'm finally done blabbering uh, about this stuff. So next week we'll talk about, uh, we'll actually read, uh, you know, the opening part to the epistle to the Romans. Uh, and, and so, yeah, we'll have fun. Any comments, questions, concerns, criticisms, any fruit flying my way? Spirit. I like it. All right, well, somebody close us out in prayer, and thank you all for being here tonight. The future will not be always so lecture-driven, okay? Just FYI. Somebody want to close us out in prayer? Father, we're grateful tonight for this opportunity to come together and look at a book that we may be with on the surface.